Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report for Hour 3. Mm. And we have uh, John Moore, uh, Tim Alexander, and Morrison. Uh, John, tell us the latest what's going on. Ah, we don't have John. Okay. Ann, are you there? Yes, I am, John, um, Dr. Bill. So, uh, Ann, what's the latest in terms of volcanoes, earthquakes, uh, and, of course, atmospheric changes that are occurring, including the uh, Fukushima-sponsored destruction of the ozone layer, which we now are causing record levels of UV index danger. And, of course, we also have record temperatures, not only record highs, but also record lows that uh, Robert will talk about uh, at the bottom of our three. Well, one of the impacts of the uh, UV, the deep UV that's coming down to the surface of the Earth, is that it's increasing ground level ozone. And so we're having high pollution during these um, sunny days, which is not helping because we already have heat <coughs> prostration and exhaustion, and right. then we have poor air quality too. But it's in, by the way, it's not just ozone alone. Ozone is in this, what I call this cauldron of uh, chemicals such as terpenes from pine trees and and uh, and other shrubs, as well as other chemicals like trimelitic and hydrate from diesel fuel, uh, formaldehydes, uh, benzene, and other compounds that are coming from uh, diesel and car exhaust, and all these chemicals. Uh, guys, interact with uh, ozone. Dr. Diggle and Anne, I can confirm that here in the Midwest right now, in Indiana, it's 106 degrees outside. We have at least a week of 100 degree plus days, and uh, we of course have a air advisory. And so exactly what you're talking about here in the American Midwest is uh, is happening right now. Now, those yeah, extreme yeah. climates, by the way, are going to cause crop failure, along with what I call, uh, I call a UV ozone shock. The ultraviolet light from above and the ground-level ozone will shock the crops, and you're going to have famine. And just like my ancient ancestor Joseph, the ancient Bible, because he is my ancestor, <laughs> we will have a famine starting this year. As early as this fall, famine is going to strike America and the world. Oh, yeah, corn, corn prices have already jumped tremendously. Um, the crops in Argentina and Brazil failed, and uh, so they're relying on the United States to provide the world with, with corn especially, and uh, we're not going to have it to give to the, to the people. No, I'm here, but, I'm here in the corn belt, and I want to tell you, the corn is not looking good. Uh, it desperately needs rain. We're having a drought, and then on top of the drought, when you get 107, 106, 105 degree days, one right after the other, uh, it just they, it can't take it. Yeah, what happens is you need, just need as little as 45 minutes of a 60 to 70 percent drop in ozone. These high temperature days, what's called heat shock, it shock the proteins and enzymes inside the growing plants, and then the ground level ozone literally suffocates them. Ozone suffocates plants. It's a very interesting thing how. High-level ozone can actually suffocate a plant that, that literally needs carbon dioxide, and it actually occupies the same site of carbon dioxide coming in the plant, which is, in a sense, oxygen for them. So ozone at the ground level is very toxic to plants. Yeah, I'm measuring 109 degrees Fahrenheit here in St. Louis, and uh, I want to remind people that their children are closer to the ground than they are, at least <laughs> nose to nose, and so they need to keep their children on the second story of their uh, house if they can, or at least you know as high up in the house as they can, and uh, don't let them just walk around outside. Uh, carry them to the car, and and uh, you know do everything you can to avoid exposing your children to ozone. Exactly. Um, so, uh, Tim, I, I can hear you're on there. We're following this very closely. What's going on in Syria? What's the latest news in terms of what's well, happening in Well, I'll give you the bullet points on, on my, from my site, uh, Europe. Yeah. And uh, basically, I'm, I'm telling people they live in the Middle East if they can get out now. Right. In fact, uh, I have a friend, uh, Jerry Strybos, who will be on next Thursday. And I think he's actually getting out of Saudi Arabia. They're going to, I think, Italy or whatever in the next couple of days. Uh, I think their war, some kind of regional war is impending. The, the Syrian army... Uh, sorry, is getting ready. The Turks have actually put anti-aircraft batteries on the Syrian-Turkish border, and now the Saudi Arabians. Tell us what Saudi is doing. Yeah, okay. Uh, troops are massing on both sides of the uh, Syrian-Turkish uh, border. The uh, Syrians have moved up about 170 tanks into one area. Uh, the Turks have moved in anti-aircraft batteries. Basically, they're expanding their anti-aircraft sweep uh, deep into Syria. 
Uh, you've got multiple reports of very significant troop movements uh, all over the Middle East. Uh, Israel, as you know, about a little over a month ago, called up a large number of army reserves, which are still on active service. They have been moving troops to their border with Syria. Uh, of course, Turkey has been moving troops to uh, not just anti-aircraft, but they've been moving artillery and uh, rockets uh, to their border with uh, Syria. Syria has been moving troops across to, uh, to its border with uh, Turkey. Saudi Arabia is on high alert as of yesterday, and they have been again moving troops to their borders with Iraq and Jordan. Uh, in the case of Iraq, they're very concerned about uh, Iranian-led Shiite forces crossing into uh, parts. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. I had these uh, parts uh, of. Um, uh, by the way, it also increases allergies too. Uh, Ground-level ozone makes molecules that are floating that are causing a bad, very bad allergy season be much, much oh, more allergenic. Oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, and they're moving their troops to Jordan. Jordan is on full war alert. Russia's been moving troops to its borders with Iran and Georgian, reinforcing its troops in Armenia, and it sent all of its officer families home from uh, the Russian bases in Armenia. Uh, of course, America, for uh, the last couple of months, has moved in a lot of stealth fighters. Uh, the French have moved in fighters. The British, French, and uh, American forces have moved in commandos in air, land, and sea ground forces. Uh, it's widely reported that uh, British and American commandos are in the ground in, on, in Syria and in Lebanon and other areas. Um, about a week ago, I said I thought war would probably break out within one to two weeks. It appears that's correct now. Um, according to DIFCA, Western and Arab military intervention uh, is scheduled to launch tomorrow. Whoa. Now, uh, uh, the Iron Guard actually is already happening. The knife edge between a Western uh, Arab Turkish military offensive in the next 48 hours, this was written uh, probably last night, and a big power card to wa uh, ward it off. Uh, of course, there is a meeting going on right now. Uh, I doubt that that meeting will be uh, successful. There are indications it will not. Um, so the, the Saudi units are poised with tanks, missiles, special forces, and anti-air batteries to enter Jordan in two broad uh, areas. Uh, they're going to defend uh, the king from opposition within Jordan, and then they intend to move on into uh, Syria through Jordan. Uh, now, and not only that, but we have a real problem in the South Caucasus. Uh, it appears that uh, war uh, could very quickly spread to the South Caucasus, uh, and that includes, by the way, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, um, South Odessa, and so forth. These areas border Iran, Russia, and Turkey. Uh, some of them are siding with the Western forces. Some are siding with the, the Russians. Um, the Russians are prepared to move into northern Iraq uh, as soon as hostilities break out. Yeah, well, Russians' uh, policy, there's two you know, things that you, we, uh, you're an expert on, this, uh, and Tim, and I know you mentioned it before, is the wild card of Pakistan. It's already said they're an ally of Iran, and if there's an attack in Iran, Pakistan will use its nukes in its long range and can hit five to 6,000 miles away. And Russia's policy is, the Russian bear is, it does a probing advance if there's a military, and then it has a devastating secondary response, which means Russia's response is, we're not coming at you with conventional weapons, we're going to nuke you first and then mop it up after. Yeah, if they have to. I mean, uh, yeah. the, when they, what the Georgians did to South Odessa was they, was they followed the Russian doctrine, and that is they lay a carpet of artillery and rocket fire and destroy everything, and then they move along that corridor. Right. And um, right now we are in a far worse, more dangerous situation than the Cuban Missile Crisis. Pop on, you can put it on the screen. Welcome back, and by the way, our uh, panel, uh, 
John Moore is joining us now, and uh, Tim, Tim Alexander. Tim is going to be putting a, a report up in our live stream channel. By the way, Ann and John can also do that as well. Anytime we're our panelists, we have more and more experts we're going to be bringing on where even on their own, if they get an emergency report, they can just pop it up on the live stream channel, and in real time you can see it or see it in the archives within minutes. It's uploaded and ready to go. We're also going to start transferring some of the better of these uh, reports over to uh, the Nutra Medical Clay and Iron um, YouTube channel. So people will be able to watch it on their iPad, iPhone, now their Nexus 7, Google tablet, uh, and soon the uh, the new device that, that Google's putting together on their television so you can watch YouTube cli clips and actually see more and more of this information. Um, John, your military experience, when you hear about these reports with, with DEBCA, which we know is, of course, in, in a, an arm of the Mossad, and we know that war is very, very close. In fact, it's actually closer than the death of the Archduke Ferdinand in the First World War. It's uh, closer than the events that started up the Second World War. I think we're already into World War III. The economic phase started in 9-11. It's gearing up since 2008, with, uh, even before the Beijing Olympics. And I think right now, this, uh, the, this scheme is, kind of, people just don't see it because it takes such a long time right. to mature. Well, the, the shooting of World War II began in the mid-1930s with the invasion of, of China by Japan and the invasion of Ethiopia by Italy and so forth. And, yeah. and of course, nobody called it World War II then, but clearly that's what it was. Yeah, and that's what we have now. World War III has already started. People say, oh, it hasn't started. And it may even have what I call a hiccup or a, an interlude where they decide to have a peace treaty, which I expect to pop on the scene here very shortly. In fact, I think whoever is president, that peace treaty will happen before Rosh Hashanah 2013. Uh, it may be even sooner than that. But uh, the Rosh Hashanah is the, uh, is the Jewish New Year. Uh, it's only a matter of weeks before the uh, Feast of, of Tabernacles. And the Jews have been pushing, and even uh, Mr. recently Mr. Putin visited Israel just in the last week or so, and uh, went to the temple saying he was returning to Israel to, to pray for the return of Messiah. So he's a, a very um, devout Greek Orthodox uh, Christian, and uh, Mr. Putin is also a nationalist, and he very much believes that Russia has a major part to play, just like Alexander, uh, the first czar of Russia, uh, and I believe that we're going to be seeing that. We're going to see Russia play a major role in the uh, end-time events that are happening here. Uh, Russia's getting ready to uh, say yet to the advances of NATO and the Turkish uh, response. What do you think will happen, uh, John, in the next few months? Well, Russia's not known to make idle threats. It's just not who they are. It's not what they do. And uh, generally, if they say something, they're going to back it up uh, with something tangible. Um, yeah. So, so the things they're saying about uh, uh, what happens if we attack Iran, what happens if Syria is attacked, those are those are very real responses uh, that will that will be backed up by uh, military hardware and, and military might. Uh, right. It's foolish to believe otherwise. It's just not who these people are. They're they're not known for flippant or uh, casual comments when it comes to matters like this. And, and by the way, people are worried about going to the airport and they have gels. And they're worried about exploding sneakers. They check your shoes off and so on. Right. If we start an attack on Iran and Syria, they're going to bring the war to us. And what they're going to do is release biological weapons in U.S., European, Canadian, and other cities in the West. And that's going to happen within weeks or days of any kind of uh, serious attack against these countries. It's Absolutely. extremely unwise to do this because these are the most advanced bio They had an entire city advancing biological weapons research in Russia, and people were really shocked. The most advanced biological weapons protection suit is Russian. The most advanced biological weapons for decades are Russian. Uh, and the Russians have the most portable advanced scalar weapons. We have scalar weapons, but the most portable scalar weapons are Russian. Uh, the most advanced jet now that's more, if you want to call, operationally uh, uh, fit to, to, for combat is the, uh, is the new uh, Russian jet for combat. It's not the Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35 or the F-22 Raptor. Uh, it's the Russian jet. And they're not only building them in Russia, they're building the same jets in China under contract. So people need to really start to kind of reevaluate where this is all going. It's going toward a global cataclysm. And uh, I believe that we're going to see a Trump because I'm getting more and more reports now that the South Pole Telescope and even the Brazilian scientists are now openly saying that he can see the reproach of the nemesis, which is called the, 
the ancient dwarf star called the Passover star, right. Heraculibus, uh, there's all kinds of names for him, the destroyer, uh, is returning to our solar system, which he did at the time of the fall of the second kingdom. And a lot of people are asking, when is it coming? Well, it's here. It's just a matter of it takes years to pass. And when it passes, the main thing it does is what's called a kill shot, which is a coronal mass ejection that can strike the Earth or come within the distance of the Earth. And these uh, changes in gravitational effects and the, uh, can also trigger off major earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, and they can also strip off the ozone layer of the uh, Earth temporarily, shocking our crops and causing famine and exposing the uh, ground level to cosmic background radiation, x-rays, etc., and high-level ultraviolet light, so it may be very dangerous to even go out during the daytime when this happens. So um, when it happens, I don't know. But I know that we're getting close because I've been sent more photos and information just today uh, on this. Uh, any comments you have, John? Well, we, we've known for a number of years. I've been at this now since uh, 2001. Uh, this is my 11th year looking into these matters. We, we've known for basically all this time that at some point, uh, amateur and professional astronomers in the Southern Hemisphere would start seeing this object. Well, we're at that point, apparently. Yeah. What I was told is it was going to be uh, the summer, last summer, which is 2011, it would be evident, and it, and it was. I was getting reports from, from uh, various scientists that it was being seen. Now we have more reports. There's even YouTube. I'm going to post up a YouTube here, a clip. Uh, we have other reports that I'm going to post up today. Uh, this is the Passover star. This is the star that the ancient astronomers knew about. That knowledge was passed on to Moses, who was trained to become the new Pharaoh. He had all the training by the high priests and had this, all this ancient knowledge. So when he was in the deserts of Midian, which, by the way, Midian deserts is down in southern Saudi Arabia, between um, uh, in, in the capital area, the area around the, uh, in Saudi Arabia of the sacred cities, that's where Moses was. They think he was somewhere else. No, he was in the southern Saudi Arabia. That's where Moses uh, spent his time in the desert. Right. Interesting, eh? It is, a, it is extremely interesting. The Bible being proved accurate once again, all over again. So, uh, John, any other comments? Well, I, I think that people need to incorporate what we're talking about and verify it. Uh, independently to their own satisfaction, and then they they have decisions to make. And doing nothing is a decision in and of itself. Decisions right. that hopefully will uh, lead to a safe haven for them and their loved ones, and and uh, a plan for them to uh, get through these hard times, which are nigh upon us. Uh, yeah, those I think who don't, uh, don't have a plan. You're going to be a refugee, and you really, really don't want to be a refugee. Yeah, one of the things that I, I've just done recently, and I've been searching through, and I found uh, this is what I've done personally. Number one, you want to have a greenhouse because you may not be able to buy food that's safe and non-radioactive. Number two, you want food supplies. We've got prepare-wise. You want to take the recommendations that John and I and Anna put together over the last few years. It's up under the preparedness list, under the wellness conditions. And go to visit uh, John and Ann's websites. That John's website is thelibertyman.com, thelibertyman.com, and his show is 7 to 9 a.m. Monday to Friday, Central Standard Time. Ann's site is homeland-defense for you, homeland-defense for number four, u.com. So when we come back, you better get ready. As I say, get your food, water, your self-protection ready. Welcome back. Uh, John, let's go through the civil defense uh, issues again, because this uh, is always good to review, review for people that haven't prepared. Uh, one of the latest things I did was, I, by the way, get a water recovery system for my roof. And uh, you can get tanks. I've got a 500-gallon tank for my uh, for one side of the house in the pool, and i got a 2,500-gallon tank, which I can expand another 25 for 5,000 gallons for my front yard, my greenhouse, and, and uh, fruit trees, etc., uh, you need to be ready for this. In Australia, actually, it's a law. You can't build a house in Australia unless you have a water roof recovery water system. And a lot of the parts for the system here that they installed in Southern California are actually made in Australia. Right. So, yeah, really interesting. I think that with the drought coming, uh, water recovery systems should be, in a sense, like not the law, but it should be like get special tax breaks. Like you need to put this on your house because the water levels on the Colorado River are dropping dramatically in Colorado. The water levels... In the Himalayas are dropping, one third, and it's because of increased glacier formation and extreme temperatures. We're seeing drought in areas and increasing uh, size of glaciers where the snow is locking the snowpack up high in the mountains. So we have a combination of extreme cold and heat, both of them very deadly. 
So let's go through the list, uh, John. You know your, your uh, list, and we can expand on that. Well, uh, I got kind of caught off guard here, and I'm not sure I got my list all that handy. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'll tell you what. You dig it up. Uh, uh, Robert, are you there? I'm here. Oh, good. Okay. While you're digging up your list, and I will pull up the wellness list on my end, Robert, give us an update on what's happening with the world in terms of volcanoes, earthquakes, ice ages, etc., and extreme weather. We've got extreme heat and cold and drought, uh, and we have all kinds of not only high temperature records set recently, but also low temperature records, which people are, may or may not be aware of. Right. You know, we're just this week, the mainstream media has come out saying they're talking about 1,000 record high temperatures in the United States during the last week. Now, I said week. Uh, and so I just posted something on my website today because they didn't bother to mention this, but uh, uh, the massive number of record low temperatures just on June 27th. Something like, uh, well, more than 100. I didn't count them, but well over 100 low record low temperatures just on that one one day on June 27th. So, you know, we're getting a lopsided picture of what's going on. Oh, yeah, we've uh, had really unusual temperatures here too. I mean, at times, believe it or not, on the coast here in California, this morning it was down to 60 degrees, which is really unusual. Now it's going to get into the high 70s and 80s, but we've had the coldest spring on record here in many, many years in Southern California. I know in the people in the Midwest where they're baking at over 100, 105, 110 degrees, but there's record lows in other places at the same time. It's really bizarre. Well, I just posted another thing on my website a couple of hours ago. In Sweden, this has been one of its coldest and wettest Junes since Get this, since 1786. Wow. Now, that, that's the high, it's, it's uh, their records, maybe even longer, but that's when their records began. But here is the darndest thing, is that the, um, the, the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, I love this, they said that Sweden's climate has become both warmer and rainier because of global warming. Yeah. Now, another area that you posted... It, it is the coldest it's been, you know, right. in, in more than 100 years, or in almost 100 years, and it's the wettest it's been since 1786, and they're blaming it on global warming. Yeah, well, of course, that, that, that's not really happening. We're having global, global climate extremes would be a better term, yeah. um, because we have hot and cold. The other thing that's the top story you have here is the deformation of the entire, entire El Hirio Island in the Canary Islands. The Azores. This is really dangerous. If this island breaks off, the tsunami will be 600 to 800 feet high, striking the uh, east coast of the United States, Europe, France, Britain. That that wall of water could wash as far in as 100 miles inland. Well, I wonder: is it going to break off, or is it just going to blow up? I I don't know. Uh, well, either way, either way, it'll be it'll create a giant super tsunami, and we know that these tsunamis yeah. have happened from the uh, Azores in previous geological history. Do you have any information on it, John? Because I have a little bit on this. Well, there is, there is a, a record of this happening in, in the Canary Islands, and uh, this form of earthquakes continues to be uh, a matter of great concern. Uh, people on the East Coast need to educate themselves. Uh, be aware of this, because uh, any warning that comes, if this was to break loose, um, I'm not sure the warning would be in time to... Uh, have any effective evacuation and basically eight miles uh, eight hours for this uh, wave to cross the ocean at, yeah if it started at, at, at night for example because of the uh, the movement of the sun that rises in the east if you had a warning let's say at two in the morning and it was going to arrive on the east coast at 10 a.m. Uh, and they got that notice at eight o'clock when they get out of bed they only have two hours to get out and all the freeways will get jammed and if you're exactly. not roughly a hundred miles inland or above <clears throat> above 1,500 uh, feet elevation, you're likely going to get inundated because this will be a surge. Well, it'll keep pushing the water in and in, and all the debris will act as a plow, cutting down and chopping, just like the tsunami in Indonesia, only this will be somewhere around 8 to 10 times higher and with energy levels around 100,000 times more energy traveling as much as not 5 miles in, uh, like the tsunami in Japan and Sendai, but 100 miles in. Right. Right. Well, you're talking about the area where uh, tens of millions of people live, work, uh, shop. Uh, basically, the infrastructure that supports the lives of all these people yeah. and the people themselves. Yeah, what I've heard it estimated is that in the path of this, 
uh, danger zone is around 115 million Americans alone, not including Canadians, Brits, uh, people in Europe as well. So we're talking about somewhere around two to three hundred million people are in extreme danger uh, if this breaks off. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's a clear and present danger. People need to be aware of this, yeah. educate yeah. themselves, and, and take uh, appropriate measures. The other, of course, you mentioned the Yellowstone geysers being more active. And uh, uh, what about uh, other things happening? And one of the things that's been going on, too, is you mentioned this last time you were on, Robert, is that a lot of people see the drop in the water levels in the Ganges River and the rivers coming off the Himalaya Mountains. They don't realize it's being locked up in the glaciers in the, in the Alps. Uh, and, of course, in other areas of the world, it's also drought as well. So we have increased uh, heat in some areas, but we also have increased low temperatures, lower low temperatures that are locking the, the precipitation, whatever it is, in uh, these glaciers high up in the Alps. So all over the world, the glaciers, 80% of them are increasing, 10% are staying the same, and 10% are, are decreasing. But most of the glaciers in the world are not decreasing. They're actually increasing, aren't they? Oh yeah, I, I I don't know where it is. I uh, I I put this one on my website uh, a few days ago, but uh, it turns out I'm I'm going to have to look for it because it it turns out that uh, that the glaciers in in uh, Antarctica, which we've been told that they're you know they're melting like crazy. And uh, I just found it. It's called the, uh, the, the title of this uh, article. If anybody wants to look it up, oops, Antarctic ice shelves not disappearing after all. Now this was the the United Kingdom Register that tells it like it is. They said Antarctic ice sh- shelves not melting at all, and that's their headline. I call that a good, honest headline. And yet, uh, <coughs> Science Daily had their article elephant seals help uncover slower than expected antarctic melting well <laughs> slower than expected is not quite the same as not melting at all but that's what it is is not melting at all they uh, they had these elephant seals that they were able to attach sensors to and the elephant seals were able to uh, swim under the ice in antarctica on the uh, I think it's a thimble uh, ice sheet. Anyway, they were able to swim under there, and they actually remained there for several months, just playing and living there. And when they they read all these uh, sensors, it turns out that the ice sheet is not melting the way they thought it was from underneath, and the snow is still following falling on it from from the top. So, what they finally said that this indicates that the shelf is neither losing nor gaining mass because ice buildup from snowfall has kept up with the race of mass loss. And, that, you know, this is, and it turns out, all of this stuff that they've been talking about with the melting ice in Antarctica, I didn't realize this, it was, all of it was based on computer models. They had not taken one thing no sampling. measurement. No No sampling. Welcome back. I want to go through just a little bit of that list and get John to help us here. Uh, that list I popped up, it's up on the prepared right, list here. under P. Uh, and the first one, of course, is you need to get a water filter. We have the BEV 100 system, BEV 200, BEV 200 system, which is the emergency tackle box system with a 12 volt pump. This is the system that will pull out all the radioisotopes, all the toxins. You can take a, a rain puddle from Fukushima and turn it into di- cleaner than distilled water. That's how amazing the okay. system is. Well, number two on the list, Dr. Bill, is uh, at least one thirty caliber rifle and 500 rounds of ammunition for each adult, uh, maybe two two threes for the uh, smaller stature people. Uh, number three, cast iron cook pots and skillets. Uh, they'll last several lifetimes if properly cared for. Number four, uh, a truck or a van, something that can carry a lot of people, uh, equipment and supplies, preferably diesel for a number of reasons. Number five, uh, at least one heavy canvas tent or a heavy canvas tarpaulin for emergency shelter for yourself or for unexpected guests. Number six, 900 pounds of grain per person per year. I, I recommend at least a two-year supply and properly stored so that the weevils and, and uh, bugs can't get at it. Uh, number seven, a comprehensive medical kit. Of course, the training to go with it so you can uh, save some lives if it com- comes down to it with emergency medical treatment. Number eight, kind of generically heavy leather high-top boots. Uh, get your boots and, and hats and gloves where the 
farmers and the construction worker shop, uh, the lightweight uh, uh, recreational gear sold these sporting goods stores will not stand up. You need the heavy stuff that the farmers and construction workers wear. Uh, number nine, vacuum-packed heritage garden seeds. You need to learn, get those skills, learn how to grow a garden and harvest those uh, those fruits and vegetables. Uh, number ten, a book of the uh, titled Dare to Prepare by Holly Deyo, D-E-Y-O. It's one of the excellent encyclopedia-type books on uh, per, on preparedness. Uh, number eleven, um, the paratrooper bicycle available at my website. This is the same folding bicycle used in Afghanistan by our troops. It's the only full-size uh, folding mountain bike. Number 12, a hand crank, AM, FM, short wave, and or uh, weather band radio so you can always keep uh, keep abreast of what's going on with a hand crank radio. And last but not least, a radiation detector with gamma ray spectrometer so you can keep track of the radiation in your neighborhood. Yeah, and by the way, they have the uh, uh, what's called the uh uh, now in Japan, they sell cell phones with radiation. The ones I recommend are on our website, Less CMF, that has the uh, Inspector EXP and the Inspector Plus, and you can also get a, a, a an attachment to actually download it on your computer. A couple of other things: the we recommend the uh, Prepare Wise dehydrated and freeze dried foods. You want to make sure you're ready for chemical, biological weapons. We have a radiation kit and a biological weapons kit called the First Line of Defense Kit. I strongly recommend everybody gets a greenhouse or at least the material to build one if you have a 100 mil poly and deck screws and the uh, and the materials to do that hydroponics is a good way um, I found the best solution at this point in time for power is to and I'm expanding this further is to get a generac uh, 20 kilowatt to 48 kilowatt generator on propane or natural gas better propane have also either solar or wind and get a power controller and I uh, found a source now uh, for the lithium pyrophosphate batteries, which are much better than the deep cycle other types of batteries. And that way you can run on, the power controller will determine if you need to just draw from your batteries, it needs to kick on your generator from propane, <clears throat> or you're just going to be uh, drawing live from your uh, solar panels. The uh, You want to be able to, to recover water. I strongly recommend roof water collection. If you do have a possibility of a well, you want to also have a storage tank system uh, set up for that. And um, you need to have, uh, besides the 30 caliber guns, I strongly recommend people get shotguns, 12 and 20 gauge shotguns, at least have 500 rounds per person. And the Castle Defense System uh, from Greg Evenson is a really good system. He has DVDs and videos on that. Uh, I recommend it also that people get a solar oven so that they can cook with that uh, if necessary. And there's the top 20, uh, 37 items, and I've added these 37 items here, or 25 items that are that are, uh, I strongly recommend people get, and if they look at that long list, these are things that are, if there ever is a disaster, they're going to disappear almost immediately from store shelves, and you want to have those kind of stockpiled in your in your uh, pantry. So Absolutely, you do, and yeah. it's better to be a year or two early than one day too late. Yeah, exactly, and uh, you know, I'm kind of, it's a work in progress. You're always working on it, always trying to help, and then as other people visit and say, oh, what do you got there? Oh, I got a 20 kilowatt generator. I got backup power. I got a roof water recovery system. Well, why do you use that? There's a water tank over there. I said that that water. Most people don't realize that 18 percent of the power in California is used to pump the water over the Tlachapi Mountains, or it's from the uh, Colorado River that could easily be shut off by a giant earthquake. You need to have water recovery. If you don't have water security, you're dead. Absolutely. DE80 dead very quickly within three to four days. In fact, that's called the Liverpool Pathway, where they just decide to not give you water anymore. That will kill you in four days. Right. Now, the first drink you take of bad water is a one-way ticket to diarrhea, dehydration, and death. Yeah, exactly. You go into cardiogenic shock, and you're dead. The worst way to die, by the way, is dehydration and starvation. The second worst way is suffocation, and the, and the third worst way is pain. So believe it or not, the worst way to die is dehydration and starvation. Interesting, eh? It is. It your is. Your tissues are literally, it literally burning your tissues up. Um, and any suggestions in terms of civil defense, what people need to do if there is a massive radiation release, because I'm predicting uh, several things, and I don't know when they'll happen, but I, I predict the first major burp, whether it's reported or not, will be this summer uh, from Fukushima. We'll have numerous burps. Some of them will be even worse than this first one, but I expect the next major one will be a big burp of radiation. And people need to be prepared with their first line defense kit, civil defense. They should have things like be prepared to have plastic things in their shoes, be able to have uh, raincoats and other things to protect themselves. 
and also have a filter on their house, I recommend a, a HEPA filter and uh, NIOSH N95 masks if you go out, if there's a radiation alert. I've tried to contact Senator Wyden repeatedly that we need to collect data from at least 100 uh, commercial flights per day that cross the Pacific Ocean or around America and Canada. That data we need to tell us where the plume is and how fast it's moving and how high the radiation is. Let's say it's uh, 30,000 becquerels per cubic meter, rather where background is normally, let's say, 20 becquerels per cubic meter, uh, and you fly a jet aircraft at some 26 to 30,000 feet through that, they suck in the air and concentrate inside the cabin, you're going to get a massive radiation exposure just by flying through that, that cloud for maybe 5 or 10 or 20 minutes. And people need to be aware that they're in that danger right now. And, I, and I'm trying to find out whether or not my suspicion is they don't have bad dry cleaning, but the uh, airline stewards and stewardesses from Alaska Airlines threw through, flew through radiation plumes from Fukushima caused by repeated burps of radiation that came from uh, the Daiichi plant. Dr. Bill, what's the reason for the plastic in the shoes? You want to be able to uh, to uh, not get your feet contaminated if you leave your shoes outside because you want to, don't want to bring them in the house because they'll be bringing in radioactive dust. So you want to have the plastics around your shoes and inside what? the shoes when you put your feet in so that the shoes, if they're left outside, will not be uh, you will not be carrying in particles on your socks into the house. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you want to so, have. Yeah, go ahead. You want to have. Don't. Yeah, you want to have indoor clothes and outdoor clothes. When you come home, you want to remove all your outer clothing. You probably want to set up an alcove. Yeah, at your almost entry. like a, like, you know, almost like you're a guy, kind of like a mechanic. You take off your overalls. You leave all your stuff out in the in this outside porch or a decon area, and you leave all the things out there. And you can even test it periodically to see how radioactive it is. But people need to be prepared to start kind of thinking this way. Well, you know, regardless of whether there's the uh, the radiation or not, or not, that that list that John just gave us, that sounds very good to me. As you know, if we're going into an ice age, because I think that as we head into an ice age, we're going to be having people moving south and and trying to move into, you know, there's going to be too many people trying in trying to move into too small an area. Well, uh, so I think you're going to need that grain. I think you're going to need those that ammunition. I think you're going to need uh, all of those things that he's talking about. It leaving out the radiation part, you're still going to need that stuff. Is my recommendation, Robert? The last ice sheet I think was south of uh, what town in Washington State, but then it dips down to the Midwest. It was actually just north of St. Louis, and it goes it's back a, up north where uh, it sort of sends heads up back from the from the Midwest further north. But a good part of these, uh, the northern United States and all of Canada was covered by a giant ice sheet. And uh, people think, well, that can, can't happen. Well, yes, it, will it can. You, it will happen. And it may, be, it it may happen over as little as, ten, as 3 to 20 years where the snow just doesn't go away and the snowpack continues and you don't have rail or uh, road traffic at all. Well, just look at the last week in Duluth. They had, uh, what was it, 10 inches of rain in one day. And Duluth is in the area where they did have that snow. That 10 inches of rain, if that had been in the wintertime, would have been 100 inches of snow, 8 feet of snow in one day. Well, you, can see the signs of the, you can see the signs of the, of the ice age actually around Duluth. You can see it around Nova Scotia. You can see it around Maine. Giant yeah. boulders that are the size of buildings yeah. left there by the ice sheet. It's amazing. Yeah. Any suggestions, uh, John and Ann? We have some crazy things going on. We have Obamacare. I call it the abomination care. <laughs> Hog tie the country with paperwork. Stifle innovation. Increase the costs for drugs and medical care. Ruin medicine altogether and bankrupt the country. We can have better solutions than this. Let's hope our next government will nullify this because John Roberts is going to have some kind of kuru or brain-consuming disease to pass this. <laughs> 